I'd like to talk about perhaps uh, we're turning the corner in what we know about the relationship between what we eat and our health. In, in the old way of thinking, the idea was, well, I eat a bad food, like high cholesterol, bacon, sausage, things like that. And I get a disease, like a high cholesterol level or a heart attack. And, and that's all true. That's, that's just as important as it ever was. But we've learned something else. And that is that virtually everything in our body is controlled by hormones. Uh, estrogen and testosterone, <clears throat> they control our reproductive function, of course, but also how we feel from day to day. Insulin is a hormone that controls our blood sugar, and that has an enormous influence throughout our body. Our thyroid gland makes thyroid hormone, and there are many others. But did you know that foods allow us to control our hormones and that sometimes if the foods aren't chosen very carefully, they can push our hormones in the wrong direction. So the idea, the reason I called my latest book, Your Body in Balance, is that hormones can be dangerous if they're at too low of a level or too high of a level. And they can also be, they are obviously essential to life if they're in the right spot. So that's what we want to do. All right, let me walk you through it. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to start with insulin. Now, a little backstory. Uh, I grew up in North Dakota. My whole family was in the cattle business. <laughs> my whole, my uh, grandpa and his father, my uncles and cousins and everybody. And my father grew up in the cattle business, but he did not care for it. And he left the cattle business and went to medical school and became the diabetes expert for Fargo. And in fact, all of Eastern North Dakota and Western Minnesota, my father really was the guy uh, who, who treated people with diabetes. However, I never once heard him say that anybody with diabetes got better because the whole idea was let's use insulin to try to get blood sugar down to where it ought to be and try to encourage people to lose weight if that could help, but they didn't really get very far. And so the, the whole goal of that time wasn't to, to make the disease go away. That wasn't in the mindset. The whole goal was just to slow the decline, slow the, the damage, slow the complications like blindness or heart disease or amputations. However, We've learned something very surprising. Let me share it with you. Okay, so I want to start with, with the first hormone is insulin. Insulin, as you know, has the job of getting blood sugar, the sugar in the blood to go into your cells so it can power you. So I want to walk you through how this works. And then I want to show you how we can control it in surprising ways and how many people are letting it really get off the scales in the wrong way. Okay, so this big purple oval that you see, that is a muscle cell a cell in your body. And that cell, let's call it a muscle cell, it needs sugar to function. Sugar is its fuel. So glucose is the sugar and the, the glucose is all around the cell. It's in the blood. But to work, it needs to get inside the cell. But you know what? It doesn't. It doesn't get through. The glucose molecules can't get through the cell membrane. So we have a key and the key is insulin. And that insulin key arrives at the surface of the cell, just like a key in a lock. And it signals little doors to open, little channels to open. I'm being a little simplistic here, but you get the idea. Uh, and that allows glucose to come into the cell, okay? So insulin is a key that admits glucose. Great. So what could go wrong? I mean, why do people have high blood sugar? How do they end up with diabetes? Well, with type 2 diabetes, it starts with this and this. These, when I was a kid growing up, these were all the kinds of things that were in my diet, and they may still be in the diets of a whole lot of other people. All these foods have fat in them, meat products, oils. They have a lot of fat. So what? Fat particles build up inside the cell. These are, this is not a huge amount of fat or say under your skin or around your tummy or on your waistline. This is microscopic, microscopic fat particles inside your muscle cells. And when fat particles build up inside the cell, it causes a condition called insulin resistance. The cell is filled with fat. And so now insulin doesn't work very well. The insulin key still, is att still attaches. It's there parking at the surface of the cell, but it's not working. You see that the glucose molecules can't get inside the cell. Nothing's going right. Hmm. Insulin resistance is caused by fatty foods getting fat inside the cell. What do I do? 
well, what if I stop eating animal products? In fact, there won't be any animal fat in my diet anymore. In fact, what if I go another step? What if I keep oily foods in general really low? Then the fat starts to dissipate. The fat comes out of your muscle cells and also out of your liver cells. By the way, doctors hate words like fat because it has only three letters. So we call it intramyocellular lipid, but that's just fat inside your muscle cells. And it starts to go away. Isn't that nice? And so now the key works again. So insulin resistance is replaced by insulin sensitivity. And now the glucose goes into the cell where it belongs and everybody's doing great. Okay, super. So what we've learned is that we can make insulin work more poorly by eating fatty things, especially animal fat, saturated fat. But we can make it work better by getting these things out of our diet because that pulls the fat out of our cells. And now the cell is not encumbered with a lot of fat and the insulin key works again. Okay, now let me back. That, that's, the, that's the concept. That's the mechanism. But now let's back up. And I want to show you to the research that led to this surprising new way of viewing things. I want to go back to 1996. Let's go to Yale University, New Haven, Connecticut. Michael Roden and his colleagues working with Jerry Shulman and Kit Peterson and their, their, their experts in New Haven. They did a lipid infusion. What I mean is uh, you, you bring in volunteers and you start an IV line in a vein and you put lipids, fat, into their bloodstream. And then you watch what happens. And what happens was their insulin sensitivity starts to decline. The more you put lipid into their blood vessels, the more their insulin sensitivity uh, starts to decline, their insulin resistance builds up. What's important about this is this didn't occur over weeks or months or years. We think about, think about insulin resistance as taking years to develop. You could develop it in one day. You could develop it in a matter of just a few hours. Okay, so now let's take the next step. If a lipid infusion will do it, what if I eat a hamburger? Or what if I eat a steak or I eat some, something else really greasy? Will that do it? So Michael Roden's team, they're now in Germany, uh, decided to test palm oil. And they put palm oil in a single meal. Now, it was a lot, but it was not out of the range of what people would eat in a, in a typical day. But what they showed is, yes, Palm oil in a single meal will reduce insulin uh, sensitivity. By the way, if, if you have a photo strip on the right side of your screen, you might just minimize that or drag it out of the way. I want to make sure you see this. Okay, so palm oil, as you probably know, is bad fat. It's high, very high in saturated fat. I would encourage you to avoid it completely. So let's look at what people think of as a healthier oil. Let's look at canola oil. It's not so much saturated fat. It's more monounsaturated fat, but they've got more or less the same result. Not quite as bad. But although saturated fat seems to cause more insulin resistance, probably any kind of fat can contribute to it. Okay, so if I want to make insulin work better, you get the fat out of the diet. And if one does this, what you can see is that not only does insulin resistance improve, diabetes improves. In our research team, we found that A1C, the marker of blood sugar control, improved three times more with a low-fat vegan diet than with the best current diet. It's the really the way to go. And now we know why. You're getting the animal fat out of your diet. You're keeping vegetable oils low too. The fat comes out of your cells and your insulin can now work again. Fabulous. Okay, uh, hormone number two. Let's talk about estrogens. Estrogens, that's a group of female sex hormones. There are many of them. This will not be on the test, but in a young woman in her reproductive years, estradiol predominates but there are others, estrone, estriol, and others, okay. So I was sitting here at this desk a number of years ago and my phone rang and it was a young woman who called up and said she couldn't get out of bed and she needed my help. I said, what, what's the problem? She said, my mother told me to call you. Her, her mother turned out to be a physician in another part of the country who, whom I knew. And this young woman had menstrual pain. Many women have menstrual pain. But for maybe one in 10, it's off the scale. I cannot function today. And this young woman had a business meeting she needed to get to, but she couldn't, she couldn't get on the plane. She could, really couldn't function. So she wanted me to give her some painkillers. And I said, yes, I can give you some painkillers for a couple of days, but what's going to stop this from happening again next month? 
And so I was, as she was describing what she was going through, I found myself trying to envision what could the problem be. Okay, let's walk through the, the possibilities. Uh, the most likely, or the first thing you're going to think about is what we call primary dysmenorrhea. If you look at the middle of your screen, that's the uterus. Off to the sides, you see the ovaries, and they're connected with the fallopian tubes. Okay, so that pink skinny little layer in the middle, that's the endometrium, the endometrial layer. That's the, the inner lining of the uterus, and it's there to welcome a little developing embryo that might arrive. Um, so every month in anticipation of pregnancy, that end endometrial layer thickens up. But at the end of the month, it breaks up in menstrual flow. And when it breaks up, it releases prostaglandins that cause pain. So my hypothesis, my educated guess, if you will, was that this young woman had maybe too much estrogen in her blood. The estrogen was causing too much endometrial thickening. And that in turn, at the end of the month, what she was experiencing was this uh, breakdown of this larger endometrial layer leading to the production of prostaglandins and a whole lot of pain. Okay, that's one possibility. But there's another one, and that's endometriosis. Do you know this word, end endometriosis? All caregivers on the call obviously do. Endometriosis is where the endometrial cells are not inside the uterus, or they, they may be there, but some of them are outside the uterus as well. And they look like these little raisins. They're on the outside of the uterus. They're stuck on the ovaries or the fallopian tubes. And they can even be on the intestinal tract. And that causes all kinds of symptoms that you don't want. So endometriosis is a thankless condition. For some women, it causes terrible pain. It leads to infertility because of the damage to the ovary, the damage to the fallopian tube. It causes bowel problems because the cells attach to the bowel and disrupt its movements. No fun. Okay. So in both cases, estrogens drive the pathology. If I've got more estrogen in the blood, it's going to make that endometrial lining thicken up more. At least that's our mechanism. If it's endometriosis, estrogen causes the really the proliferation of those uh, extra uterine tissues. You don't want that. So as she's talking, I found myself remembering something. At Tufts University, researchers did some really amazing research on how to control estrogens. They brought in 48 premenopausal women, women during their reproductive years. They put them on a metabolic ward and they gave them isocaloric weight maintaining diets, meaning you're going to make the diet so that nobody's weight really changes, but you give them a short diet that reduces the fat content. Or you give them a short-term diet, eight to 10 weeks, that increases the fiber content, one or the other, or maybe we do a diet that does both. We're going to reduce the fat, increase the fiber. And what they discovered was that just reducing the fat in the diet causes estradiol and estrone, other estrogen fractions, to diminish. Only increasing fiber, okay, fiber, if you increase fiber, the estrogen fractions drop as well. So either you reduce fat or you increase fiber. In either case, estrogen levels fall. Now, these researchers were not thinking about menstrual pain. What they were thinking about is breast cancer. If I want to reduce the risk of breast cancer, how about if we reduce the estrogen driver of breast cancer? Okay, makes sense. And it looks like foods can do that. Okay, so I suggested something to this young woman. She's had terrible menstrual pain. And I said, let me give you some painkillers for today, tomorrow, so, so that you can function again. But would you like to also try an experiment with me? Would you like to try a diet change? And she said, whatever it is, I'll try anything. I said, okay, for the next four weeks, how about this? No animal products. Vegan, it's going to be a vegan diet. Now, now, why would you do that? Because now there's no animal fat. I'm reducing fat. And everything you eat is a plant. So everything you eat has fiber in it. I'm reducing fat. I'm increasing fiber. Rule number two, minimize oil. Okay, got it. So now I'm really reducing the fat. I'm increasing the fiber content of her diet. My hope is that that will allow her estrogen levels to come down, less stimulation on the uterus or the endometrial cells next month. Maybe she'll feel better. Well, as it happened, four weeks later, my phone rang again. And it was the young woman. And she said, Dr. Barnard, I can't believe this. My period started today and I got nothing. 
I got no symptoms. I feel perfectly fine. And I said, well, let's, let's keep going with this. Great, great, great. So the next month, same thing. The next month, same thing. She's feeling fine. So what we discovered is this experience seemed to endorse the idea that estrogen levels can be modified based on fiber content and fat content of the diet. So that's one person. So we really need to do a larger study to see, is this real? Uh, will this affect other people? So with our colleagues at Georgetown University, we brought in 33 women. Half of them went on a diet, half of them went on a supplement. The diet was low-fat vegan. When I say vegan, I don't mean a person from the planet Vegas. I just mean a person who eats no animal products. Um, and the supplement that we used for comparison was really a placebo, a dummy pill, okay? After two months, the people switched. The diet group began the supplement, the supplement group began the diet. Okay, in a nutshell, it worked. Uh, we published the results in obstetrics and gynecology, and what we found was that pain intensity diminished, the duration of the pain diminished, and PMS symptoms got better as well. Bloating and water retention and moodiness, all of these things seemed to diminish. Now, I should say that there were different results for different people. For some, the effect was really small. For others, it was life-changing and huge, and their symptoms were just gone. Um, does this mean that some were following the diet better than others? Well, sure, but we really don't know um, in any given case how much the effect is going to be. But for every single woman who has had endometriosis and has had surgery for it, and like so many has had the problem just come right back, and has had the doctor say, well, you're a woman, you have to put up with this kind of stuff. For every woman who said, enough of that, a diet change should always be something that we explore to see how it works. Okay, let me tell you about uh, a young woman named KL. She grew up in Louisiana. She was an Air Force aerospace engineer, and she went to Iraq in 2003. Now, while she was in Iraq, she was working pretty hard. And she was eating what the government provided, which is not necessarily so much or very indulgent. Uh, but eventually her tour of duty came to an end and she was sent back to the U.S. And when she got off the plane, her family vowed to make up for all the foods that she was missing in Iraq. OK, what did you miss? Oh, you know what I missed? I missed cheese. Mac and cheese, cheese snacks. All these things. Well, okay, fair enough. So uh, they made up for lost time. Lots of restaurants, lots of cheese. In fact, a friend of hers for her birthday gave her an entire case of 48 boxes of mac and cheese dinners, which she ate for 48 days straight. I'm not making this up. Well, what happened? She gained weight, but she also developed abdominal pain. It became more and more severe and turned out to be endometriosis. Okay. She sat down with her doctor. The doctor says, well, you know about the pain, but it's also going to lead to infertility. Fair enough. Let's give you pain medicines. Let's give you hormonal treatments. Let's see what we can do. It really was not doing the job. She just couldn't function, which, which is true for a great many women with endometriosis. And the doctor said, well, it's one other treatment we can give you. We can do a hysterectomy. Just take out your uterus. Let's just take it all out and the pain should be gone. Well, she was about 27, and she said to the doctor, my husband and I are kind of newlyweds. We were hoping to have a family, but the doctor told her that she was probably infertile anyway because of the extent of her endometriosis, and she probably had nothing to lose by having the hysterectomy. Okay, well, she decided, all right, I'm infertile anyway. I can maybe just get rid of the pain with surgery. Let's do it. So they scheduled the, the hysterectomy for six weeks later. They couldn't do it sooner. And during that interval, she talked to somebody about her diet. She saw a nutrition coach who said, if I were you, I would get rid of the animal products. I keep the oils really low, the, the diet that we had pioneered for menstrual pain. She put it to work and she felt better. She felt a lot better. Uh, she was losing weight. Her energy was better, but her symptoms improved. But they weren't, they weren't really gone there was still a little bit of that residual pain. And so she decided, well, if the hysterectomy makes all the pain go away, sign me up, that's what I'll do. So on the appointed day, she went to the hospital and she was anesthetized. 
And about an hour later, she woke up. And she was in the recovery room. And the doctor was there. And the doctor said, I need to tell you something. I opened you up. I looked inside. And your endometriosis is essentially gone. I didn't take your uterus out. I I didn't do the hysterectomy. You don't need that. The reason that you had some residual pain is that you had scarring and you had adhesions where the where the endometriosis used to be. And so all I did was I just freed up those adhesions and I think you're going to be fine now. Okay. Now, why did this occur? Well, the doctor said, I have no idea how this endometriosis went away. Well, her mother was in the recovery room with her. Her mother said, well, she went vegan, doctor. <laughs> the doctor said, stop it. Foods don't cause endometriosis. There is no way that a diet change is going to improve endometriosis. This must just be a miracle. Miracles happen all the time. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to praise the doctor for not taking out her uterus. But I think he was maybe uh, not aware that diet affects estrogen levels and estrogens drive endometriosis. Um, The work that was done at Tufts, that was done at other major medical centers, was apparently not well known. But a diet change makes estrogen change. And when it, when estrogen levels diminish, endometriosis doesn't have so much drive anymore. Okay, so what happened? Well, she lost weight. She felt better. And for her and her husband, maybe best of all is she wasn't infertile. After all, they have three children now. So there you have, in fact, she's uh, decided to become an instructor to help other women to change their lives. Um, and really gain control over their health. Okay, now I talked about cheese. She loved cheese. Does cheese have hormones in it? Well, yes. Okay, biology 101. Cows do not make milk. Mammals do not, no no mammal makes milk. Humans do not make milk until they have become pregnant and given birth. So every glass of milk that you ever drank in your life came from a cow who was artificially inseminated. And it's not a very pretty picture. The farmhand puts his left arm up her rectum, uh, up to his elbow, grabs the, you can feel the uterus through the rectal wall and he holds it steady. And then with his right hand, he takes what looks like a knitting needle and rams it through her cervix and injects semen from a bull. And she is now fertile, uh, uh, fertilized. And nine months later, the gestation is finished. She gives birth. Okay, it's a creepy process. Ethically, people object to it, obviously, for all the reasons that you know. The calves are taken away. The males are killed for veal. The females are are raised in isolation, and they are going to be inseminated too. Creepy stuff. But the reason I'm telling you this now is the biology of it is important. She's pregnant for nine months. During her pregnancy, she is milked during much of the pregnancy. During her pregnancy, what's she making? She's making estradiol, of course. And so it gets in her plasma, but it gets in her milk. And so down the little milking tubes goes little bits of estradiol. It ends up in your yogurt, in your cheese, in your sour cream. And I don't care if it's organic dairy or not. It's got estradiol in it. And if you feed it to your eight-year-old son or your seven-year-old daughter, you are feeding them female sex hormones every day or feed it yourself. This is part, part of why researchers have found that male infertility is associated with cheese consumption. Okay. All right. Am I cheering you up? <laughs> it's frightening, isn't it? But surprising. Um, so yes, uh, cows are impregnated annually on every dairy farm. They are milked well into their pregnancies. Estrogen gets in the milk. And if you are drinking dairy milk, you are getting estrogen. And I would encourage you to avoid dairy milk. Same thing, by the way, same thing for goat milk, same thing, same for organic skim. It doesn't matter what country it's from. It's always the same. Okay. So there's no such thing as hormone-free milk. And by the way, to underscore this, uh, many dairy farmers, uh, some some will use uh, bovine growth hormone to stimulate more milk production. Others will not. So farmers who do not use bovine growth hormone, which is most of them, went to the FDA and said, we want to label our milk as hormone free because we're not using bovine growth hormone. Well, the FDA said, your milk isn't hormone free. I don't care who you are. It's got estrogen in it, doesn't it? Oh, Yeah. So you will never see a carton of milk labeled hormone-free because it's all got hormones in it. The dairy industry doesn't want to tell you, but there it is. Okay, Um, 
Now I want to go to the other end of the reproductive window. Oh, by, by, by the way, before I go here, I just want to mention to you, um, milk is probably associated with breast cancer as well, and probably for the same reason. The, the reason that you don't hear much about this is that in the American population in general, it's been rather hard to tease out the relationship between dairy and breast cancer. The population is relatively homogeneous with regard to dairy intake. Um, however, we have two lines of evidence that have come in quite strongly. One is the Adventist Health Study, which includes many women who don't milk, don't consume milk at all, and many who consume a lot of it. And you see this nice or frightening uh, relationship between dairy intake and breast cancer. The other it comes from China, the China Biobank. China is a country that historically didn't consume dairy products at all. It was not their thing. No milk. And during westernization, of course, milk and cheese have come in, and you now see still dairy products that are not big in China, but among those who have incorporated them more in their diet, you're, you're seeing more and more breast cancer. So the researchers at the, at the China Biobank strongly believe, as do the researchers at Adventist Health Study, that there is a relationship that becomes obvious when you look at those who avoid dairy and those who consume substantial amounts of it. So my advice in general is to avoid dairy completely. Okay, now let, let's go ahead and let's talk about the, the vasomotor symptoms of menopause. We're now, a woman's around 50 and her reproductive window is, is coming to its end. And for some, they get vasomotor symptoms. What's that? That's hot flashes. It's the middle of the night. You wake up 2 a.m. and you're in a pool of sweat. Or it's during the day and you're at the board of directors giving a, a presentation and all of a sudden the room feels like it's 150 degrees and you're fanning yourself and sweating. Okay, uh, you go to the doctor and the doctor says, hey, I got the perfect thing. It's hormone replacement therapy. Would you like a prescription? You'll say, sure, give me anything. And so the doctor gives you a prescription which you take to the pharmacy. And on the way there, um, as somebody's driving you, you look on your phone for the risks of hormone replacement therapy. And you look on the FDA's actual prescribing information that's supposed to come with your prescription. And you say to the person driving, stop. Have you seen the list of side effects of things that, that come from hormone re replacement therapy? Let's go home. <laughs> Let me do a little more Google searching on this. Okay, so here's what you'll find if you look into this. Back in the 1980s, Japanese women were eating a mostly rice-based diet. Rice, vegetables, some fish, uh, some meat, uh, not a lot, um, and, and really no dairy. And vasomotor symptoms, hot flashes, were extremely rare. Maybe 15% of women had them. They were not severe usually, and they didn't even have a name for, for them. They didn't call them hot flashes. It was just a little warming that would come and go. But that was the 1980s. What happened? McDonald's arrived in Tokyo and Osaka and all over the place. And the Japanese diet suddenly started westernizing. It's still nothing like what a person would eat in Minneapolis, but fat content went way up, meat went up and dairy went way up. And oh, as the burger uh, culture came in, hot flashes went way up to about 40%, a little bit more in the next couple of decades. Breast cancer rates doubled, heart disease went up, obesity became much more common. When the plant-based diet or large, mostly plant-based diet is being switched to a more meaty diet, problems arise. Okay, so what's the deal with this plant-based diet? Well, in Japan, part of it is that it was a lot of rice and a lot of vegetables and less meat, so it's more plants. But the other part is soy. Soybeans, tofu, tempeh, miso, edamame, Soybeans are a big part of Asian culture and soy, uh, soybeans contain isoflavones and they have names like genistein or daidzine or glycetine. Now these isoflavones are famous because they help prevent breast cancer. As you, as you are aware, soy products reduce breast cancer risk. And for women diagnosed with breast cancer, soy, soy products also reduce the likelihood of dying of it. Oh, by the way, for some, some people have got this 
opposite. They think that soy causes cancer. Um, that's not the case. Let me come back to that in just a minute. No, soy, soy clearly reduces breast cancer risk and, and reduces mortality for women diagnosed. But, but this, the soy isoflavones also are credited with perhaps being one of the explanations for why women reaching menopause in Japan have less hot flashes. However, that's not the whole reason. If you went down to Mexico, about two hours west of Cancun is a town called Valladolid and another town called Chichimila. And researchers from Canada went down there and they interviewed 118 Mayan women. And they said, how are your menopausal symptoms? And the answer was, what symptoms? None of the women had any symptoms. They didn't have hot flashes. They didn't have anything. It was just their reproductive window closed. That's it. Thank you very much. We're done. I'm at my age. I don't need a toddler on my kitchen floor. All right. Now, what does it have in common with Japan? They eat a grain. It's not rice. Ah, corn. Lots and lots of corn. They eat a bean. Now, it's not a soybean. What are, they, what are the beans in the Yucatan Peninsula? Black beans. Really? Yep. Okay. A lot of corn and black beans and not just that, but a lot of vegetables. This vegetable is called lechaya. Now the culture has changed dramatically. American tourists have come down there and flooded in and they've built Walmarts, but you can still go into a Walmart and they'll sell you corn tortillas and black beans and lechaya. So these foods are still commonly eaten uh, there. And this seems to play a role in a, in a, a woman's uh, hormonal function. Okay, so my research team decided to, decided to put this to the test. And now bear in mind, we didn't know, was it the plant-based diet, was it the soybeans? What is it that's, that's beneficial? We don't know. But we brought in 84 women. They all had hot flashes and half of them were randomly assigned to a diet group, the other half in a control group. Now the diet was a plant-based diet. When I say plant-based, I mean vegan, no animal products. Secondly, minimize oils. Third, a half, half a cup of cooked soybeans every day. That was the whole thing. No hormones, no medicines, no exercise, nothing. And when it came to weight, what we saw was that it caused pretty nice weight loss, about eight pounds in 12 weeks. Okay, that's a surprise. That's great. Very nice. But what the women were in the study for was their hot flashes. What happened there? Well, what we discovered is that among the controls, there was a little bit of a change. But among the intervention group, there was this enormous drop, 88% drop in moderate to severe hot flashes. That's huge. That's the kind of thing that HRT does, except what are the side effects of a vegan diet? You lose weight, you feel better, your cholesterol falls, your blood pressure comes down, your digestion gets better. The side effects are all good. Okay. So hot flashes are way, way down. The women felt this was just a life-changing experience in many ways, but we looked at other things too. The vasomotor symptoms, the hot flashes improved more in the diet group compared to the control group. The psychosocial symptoms like mood, depression, stress improved more. Uh, physical symptoms, headaches improved more and sexual symptoms improved as well. We weren't expecting that, but that's what happened. Okay, um, now let me come back to what I mentioned earlier. You will hear people say with great emphasis for some unknown reason that soy must cause cancer. What they're thinking about is that there had been some experiments on animals decades ago that seemed to suggest that soy products could cause breast cancer. This turns out not to be the case in people. Um, and as of 2008, there were eight large studies that were put into a um, meta-analysis. And what you see, particularly in Asians and Asian Americans, where you see a really a very large uh, gradient between no soy or little soy to very high soy intake, what you see is that the highest soy intake is associated with about a 29% redu reduction in risk of breast cancer. All right, let me be clear. The more soy, the less breast cancer they consume. Now, what if women have breast cancer already? And unfortunately, you will hear this naive advice by well-meaning, ill-informed physicians, some of whom are even oncologists, saying to a woman diagnosed with breast cancer, who's saying, what shall I eat? Can I eat soy? And the doctor might mistakenly say, don't eat soy. If you do that, Look, look, at this, look at these results. This was a meta-analysis published in 2013. Five prior studies 
were combined, more than 11,000 participants. They were all women with breast cancer. The red bar is the women who avoided soy or very little soy. They've got the highest mortality. The yellow and green bars are the women who had cancer, but they could started consuming a lot of soy and their risk of dying of it was substantially less, 25 or 30% less, whether they were estrogen receptor negative or positive. Let me be clear about this. If a woman avoids soy after a breast cancer diagnosis, she is now officially in the high mortality group. If she avoids soy, she's more likely to die if these, if these research results apply to her. If she consumes a lot of soy, she's more likely to survive. Now, you can consume non-GMO soy. It's easy to find. Go to the store. Every tofu block that is marked organic, by law, cannot be GMO. Same with soy milk, very easy. Okay, so let's dive in a little bit more. If soy protects against cancer, okay, those isoflavones, genistine, daisine, glycetine, there are two different estrogen receptors. Estrogen receptor alpha, that's where estradiol attaches. The estrogen your body makes or the estrogen in, 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 in dairy products attaches to estrogen receptor alpha especially, but estrogen receptor beta, that's preferentially where the isoflavones in soy attach. Oh, okay. So it looks like that soy is beneficial as part of the approach to menopausal symptoms um, and will reduce uh, breast cancer risk. And by the way, for men, uh, we see the same effect. Uh, for men consuming the most soy, their risk of prostate cancer diminishes substantially too. Okay, very good. Um, by the way, you might think, okay, how do I make those darn soybeans? If you'd like to do this, let me show you how. Uh, first of all, ed edamame are delicious. They're an appetizer you'll get at the Japanese restaurant, but that's not what I'm talking about. Edamame, that's baby soybeans. They're, they're immature soybeans. Uh, if you leave them on the vine for a little bit longer, they become mature soybeans and they have a lot more isoflavones in them. So if you go online, you'll see brands like Laura or others um, non-GMO, organic, whatever, you buy whichever one you want. Then you put it in your Instant Pot or your whatever pressure cooker you have, pressure cook them for 40 minutes. You want them to be nice and soft. If they are little rocks, they're not cooked enough, okay? Or just cook them on the stove like regular beans. Soak them overnight, cook them for an hour, hour and a half. Make sure they're well cooked though. And then you use them like, like pine nuts. Uh, put them on a salad, uh, put them in soups or whatever. The dose is a half a cup per day. So if you are making dinner for the whole family, I want you to reserve a half a cup of soybeans for you. Don't just mix them into a dish because you're not going to know what your dose was. So reserve your half a cup. Um, now, if you want to, for extra credit, you can roast them after you cook them. You pressure cook them first. Then you take a baking sheet and put some parchment paper on top and then cover it with the, the cooked soybeans. And what you will, uh, you, you want to make sure that they're nice and kind of thinned out. Um, and then you put them in the oven, bake it at about 350 for an hour, and they should come out nice and dry. If they're not dry, if there's a little moisture left, put them back in the oven. You want them dry. And then you put salt or cayenne or garlic or whatever you put on them, throw them in a bag. And this is handy because if you're traveling, you're not bringing your pressure cooker with you, but you can bring the roasted soybeans with you. Or you can actually buy them pre-roasted. You'll see brands like Toasted's from Laura, the Laura brand online, you know, they're, they're very handy. Um, but let me be clear, all three of these steps are important. If you're a woman with hot flashes, vegan, meaning no animal products at all, don't, don't try it by having chicken without the skin a couple of days a week and that ought to work. Uh -uh. This is vegan, no animal products. Number two, and this is really important, keep oils really low. We do not know why exactly. But for some women, for some reason, women who have more oils in their diet seems to they, they don't seem to do very well. Even things like extra virgin olive oil that you bought from Tuscany, um, you want to keep oils really low. That's challenging in today's world, but do this, you'll see it helps. And by the way, that also helps with, with weight loss. And third, half a cup of cooked soybeans every day. Now you could use soy milk if you want, but you got to drink two quarts of it per day to get this uh, soy isoflavones that you would get in a half a cup of cooked. Soybeans, okay. All right. Uh, so, what's a healthy diet? A healthy diet for hormonal control. We've talked about insulin. We've talked about estrogens. We've talked about menopausal symptoms. And in my book, Your Body in Balance, there's 
a lot more on thyroid function and, so, and, and others, but let me just skip to the chase. The most healthful diet includes four healthy food groups, fruits and grains and vegetables and legumes. That means beans, beans, peas, lentils. You should also take vitamin B12. You need it for healthy nerves and healthy blood. This is not optional. You, you really do need vitamin B12. Um, but starting this diet is not really automatic. And in our clinic here at Barnard Medical Center, where we're doing work via telemedicine from Washington, D.C., or, or we're seeing people in person in the clinic, if we were to just say, you ought to try a low-fat vegan diet, you're going to be great, you know, come back and see me in six months, that's not going to work very well. Because if you just logically tell a person to do it, logic plays almost no role in human behavior. And if you've turned on the television, you know this is true. Um, and in fact, if you ask, how did you decide what you're eating for breakfast this morning? You didn't think, well, I could use a certain amount of fiber in my diet and I maybe a little bit of beta carotene. No, 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 none of that happened. We ate things based on our culture. You know, what our friends eat, what our family eats, what I grew up eating, or what I'm going to call noise, what I saw on television or what I saw on display at the store. Maybe I'm addicted to something. You know, that's the, the case. People are addicted to bacon and whatever. Okay, so if you're explaining to somebody what a healthy diet is. Let me show you neurologically what's occurring in their brain while you are talking. You say to a patient or you say to a friend, this diet is incredible. My diabetes went away. This is amazing. Or my hot flashes are gone or my pain is gone. I feel so good. When you say that, the ideatron, you remember the ideatron in the brain? That releases little ideas, which start percolating around in the brain. But then those ideas like, oh, I should do a plant-based diet. Oh, vegan diet sounds good. Probably good for the planet too. The ideas irritate the familia. Then the familia signals to the don't do a Terry gland to release ignorphins. And that wipes out the whole idea. Okay. Now, neurologically, this may not be entirely accurate, but you have seen this phenomenon. For those of you who have said, I am following a, a vegan diet. Maybe you'd like to follow it too. The first, at first, the person opens their eyes and thinks, oh, that's a neat idea. But then suddenly they come back to you with, as the ignorphins kick in, they say, oh, where do you get your protein? And that's the end of the discussion. <laughs> okay, so forget that. Here's how we do it. And logic is not required. For every patient who we work with in the Barnard Medical Center or people in our research studies, here's the two-step technique to uh, adopting as close to a perfect diet as possible. I have never seen anyone unable to do it. Step one, check out the possibilities. Take a week, seven days. And during the seven-day period, your job is not to start a diet. You're not throwing anything out. You're eating what you want to eat. But what we are doing is checking out the possibilities. What would I eat if I were following a plant-based diet? I'm going to make a list. I got seven days to make my list. Take a piece of paper, write breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack. Give yourself some room. Because between now and a week from today, I want to see that list start to grow. And you and I are going to talk again a week from now. This, this is the way we always do this. Okay, works great. So, all right, let's see now. Hmm. Vegan diet for breakfast? I don't know. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, I guess I could have oatmeal without cream on it. I could put some apples or bananas or berries or whatever. Um, pancakes? Seems indulgent, but I guess if there's no butter, that's all right. Um, instead of scrambling eggs, I could scramble tofu. I don't know. If you like it, it goes on the list. If you don't, it's not on the list. So the idea is to try it. So let's go to lunch, a uh, veggie burger, maybe a uh, veggie fajitas. I don't know. Okay. And then let's go to, oh, let's go to a restaurant. My favorite Italian restaurant. It's got spaghetti with meat sauce, but it's got spaghetti with a marinara sauce or a rabbiata sauce or some other kind of spicy tomato sauce. In fact, they also make a pizza, leave off the cheese or, or go 50, 50. Uh, you have cheese on your half, none on my half. Okay. Fair enough. And you know, I can go to a Latin American restaurant go Mexican. They've got bean burritos, and beans and rice. Oh, okay. Fair enough. That, that's, that's not suffering. That's pretty good. Or, um, you know, if, if we go Chinese, they've got 30 things on the menu that are vegan already. Got rice dishes and vegetable dishes and tofu dishes, never had meat in them. Fair enough. Or let's go to the sushi bar. Start with edamame. Start with a seaweed salad, miso soup. And when my sushi arrives, it's not fish sushi. It's a cucumber roll or an asparagus roll or a sweet potato roll. All right, cool. Oh, no, no, no. I don't eat any of those places. I eat at Taco Bell. 
or I'm going to Subway. This may not be the pinnacle of culinary art, but they've got something for you too. Bean burrito, hold the cheese. Okay, that's a passable choice. Fair enough. All right. Seven days have gone by. I got my list. I got all kinds of things. I was kind of surprised <laughs> at all the things out there for me to eat. All right. You've done very well. You, you completed step one. That was simple. Step two, three-week test drive. During the next three weeks, we're going to do all vegan all the time. That's it? Just do vegan for three weeks? That's it. It's really easy because, first of all, you can do anything for three weeks. And secondly, you've already got your list. You figured out the foods you like. You probably stocked up. Okay, let's jump in. At the end of this period of time, two things will have happened. Three weeks later, you've lost some weight. I wasn't really trying, but look at the scale. It's smiling right up from my toes. That's amazing. And if you've got diabetes, your blood sugar is improving. By the way, if you have diabetes, run. Do not walk to a low-fat vegan diet. It will change your life. But because the blood sugar lowering effect is so rapid for many people, talk to your doctor first. <laughs> Anybody on medication, talk to your doctor first. Because the combination of the strong medicines you're taking, let's say you're taking insulin now and you're going vegan, your blood sugar can go, you can become hypoglycemic. So let your doctor know and say, I, I, I want you, doctor, to work with me to reduce my medications if and when the time is right. Okay. So you, you don't throw your medicines in the trash. Don't disregard your doctor's advice. This is a partnership and you work with your doctor. Same if you've got, if you're taking blood pressure medicines. If you're on a diet that lowers your blood pressure and medicines that are blowing, lowering your blood pressure, you don't want to have your blood pressure go too low. You, you stand up from sitting at the table and you get lightheaded. Okay. Let your doctor know you're doing this, okay? Because th this is a powerful diet. My point is, within three weeks, you won't feel all the benefits, but it will start. If it's menopausal symptoms you have, some people get benefits in the first week, but for mo most, it's probably four or five, six weeks into it. One thing you don't have to give up, you never have to give up skepticism. If you're thinking, I'm not sure I trust this diet, fair enough, give it a try. The science is there. Uh, you don't have to believe in tetracycline. If you got an infection, you just take it. So you try the vegan diet, see how it works for you. Um, the other thing is don't burden yourself with long-term thinking. I don't know if I could be vegan forever. I know what you're thinking. You're addicted to cheese. Okay, <laughs> you are not alone. But don't think long-term. Focus on the short-term. Don't worry about what you're going to have 20 years from now. Just think, let me see if I can get cured now. This is why I always encourage people. Some people will say, is this all or nothing? How about if I do kind of semi-vegan diet or I can maybe have a cheat day on the weekend or whatever. I would suggest setting that idea aside for now. If you've got a medical condition, let's focus on curing you now. Let's do the diet as prescribed. Let's treat the diet like a drug that you take as prescribed. And after a while, once you feel well, if you decide, I want to bring that junk back into my diet, Okay, you, you can anytime, but let's cure you now. See what I mean? Okay, so we've got lots of resources for you. We have an app, free, the 21-Day Vegan Kickstart. If you go on your iPhone or you go in your Android, you'll see it there. Um, go online. It's in English. It's in Spanish. It's got menus and recipes and cooking videos. It's fun. We'll walk you through day by day what you can do. 21-Day Vegan Kickstart. Um, and this is... Um, some you can shoot this, get out your phone. You might even shoot this right now if you want to. Uh, this QR code goes to the website you see written there, foodinstructions.org. And at foodinstructions.org, what we have is little videos about the things I've explained to you. This is especially for diabetes. Uh, insulin resistance is kind of a complicated topic. So we've made it really simple with funny little cartoon videos that we give to every patient who who is on their way out from Barnard Medical Center. So foodinstructions.org has it for you. And it's fun and it's a good way to communicate with friends who aren't yet participating in this, in this program. Um, the last thing that I just want to say is a big thank you. I really appreciate, um, first of all, the organizers. Thank you for bringing this life-saving information to so many people um, just year after year. I'm very grateful to you. Um, thank you for including me. But more than anything, I want to say a word of thanks to those of you who are participants. If you're participating in this and you've heard a message, you can share it with other people. You know, if you bring home a prescription for metformin for diabetes, I know what you're not going to do. You're not sharing that with anybody. You don't walk in the front door and say, hey, honey, I just got some metformin at the clinic. Do you want to try some? No, you don't. Do, you can't share medicines. 
But if you learned about a diet change and how foods can change how you feel physically, if they can restore your health, you can share that information with everybody and they can all use it. And if you're making my vegan lasagna, maybe they can jump in there too. You'll never know. If when, when you post this on Facebook and you tell people, do you know what I learned today? Give them the link to this program. Let's spread the word together. If you do that, you're never going to know whose life you've saved, whose life you've changed. But I guarantee you, it's lots of people. That's our work. We do the research. It's not, it's not easy, but we've got to be careful. We've got to make sure we're right. But then once we know what's right, for diabetes, for cancer, for pain, for any condition that's that's harming a person's life. We need to get the word out there. Let's make some noise together. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, doctor. That was such great information. I really, I really appreciate it. And I'm sure, you know, I, as well as many people are going to put that to great use. Before we open up our live Q&A, we'd like to make sure that everybody knows how to connect with you. You actually just shared that QR code, which is very helpful. Um, also, how to buy um, your book, your your latest book, as well as I believe you have something like 20 books. Um, so I would like to um, see how they can get those books from Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're going to show it on our website. Okay. So they're available on the real truth, uh, the real truth .com, the real truth about health .com. Um, So next we're going to be um, okay. So we're, we're going to be opening up for Q and A. For those of you that um, are not familiar with uh, how to do this, first of all, we're not going to be taking questions from the chat. We're going to be um, we're going to be uh, raising hands in the participant window. So what you're going to need to do if you are a participant and you have a question is you're going to go to the bottom of your Zoom screen and toward the right, you'll see a reactions button. You're going to click on that and then you're going to click raise hand. We're going to do our best to select uh, questions based on the order in which they were received. Uh, we will, um, when it's your turn, we'll unmute you. We'll prompt you to state your name, where you're from, and to ask your question. We ask that everyone keep their questions brief and on topic. We will then mute you after you've asked your question. In order to give everyone a chance to get their question answered, we won't be taking follow-up questions. So let's go ahead and get started. I see we have got a number of hands raised. So the first one is going to be Kathy Sabo, you're going to state your name, where you're from, and ask your question. Well, hi, my name is Kathy Sabo, and I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. Hi, Dr. Bernard. Hi, I'm, Kathy. Um, hi, I'm hypothyroid, and when you talked about soy, boy, I've heard that for people who are hypothyroid, that soy is not good for us. Why is that? Um, that we... Really, uh... Researchers have been investigating that, and the evidence for it really turns out to be rather weak. So we no longer encourage people with, with hypothyroidism to avoid soy. Um, however, let me mention some other research that has gone kind of along the same lines that has given us a, a pathway that may be fruitful. Uh, let me say quickly, I think that we need more research on diet and hypothyroidism. Um, and uh, don't cancel your doctor's appointment, because if you're on thyroid supplementation, um, you want to continue to work with your endocrinologist to make sure your levels are correct. That said, at the Adventist Health Study 2, uh, researchers looked at hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, and also looked at hyperthyroidism, Graves' disease. And they looked at dietary patterns. And what they found was amazing. They found that those people who followed completely plant-based diets, no, no dairy, no, no meat, had the lowest prevalence of hypothyroidism. And the group that had the highest, maybe surprisingly enough, was the dairy eaters, the people eating the most dairy products, the like lacto-ovo vegetarians eating not meat, but eating a lot of dairy. They, they did the worst. And then when it came to hyperthyroidism, now, once again, the, the vegans had the least, but the people who had the most were the omnivores, having dairy and meat. What we think is happening, as you know, hypothyroidism is autoimmune. So you consume a product like dairy protein. And your, your body reacts to that dairy protein by creating antibodies to the protein, which then turn around and attack your thyroid and it, they can shut the thyroid off. 
or if they attack the part of the thyroid that is controlling its action, it can't shut off and you end up hyperthyroid. That's in a simple-minded way, that's the mechanism. So what am I suggesting? I'm suggesting that you may wish to try a completely low-fat vegan diet, no animal products at all, zero. Keep oils really, really low and see over time, give it two, three months and see what happens. We have seen a great many anecdotal cases, individual cases where the hypothyroidism went into complete remission. The thing that we do not know is, is this the rule? Does this happen to a lot of people or just some? But there's, there is, are no um, reasons not to follow this diet and I'd encourage you to give it a try, but continue to you know let your doctor know you're doing it. Let your doctor get monitor, uh, monitor you as you go along. So Kathy, thank you so much for your, uh, for your question. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you, doctor. Our next question is coming from Stephen Shore. Stephen, please state your name, where you're from and state your question. Um, Stephen, I'm from Syosset. Uh, Dr. Bernard, um, if someone has is eating a, a plant-based diet with no fat, can they still have a blood sugar that's like 110, 115? And what do they do about it if they're already eating a no-fat whole food plant-based diet and they have a 110 blood sugar? Okay. All right. Wonderful question. Um, first of all, I, I saw in the chat, somebody was asking, which book are we talking about? Whether it's thyroid or diabetes, the, the book is called Your Body in Balance. Um, these topics are covered in some detail there, including bo both diabetes type one and type two. Okay. So let's say a person is trying to bring their blood sugar down and you saw my little purple oval and you notice it was filled with fat. So you take the animal products out of your diet, no animal fat. Great. You take the oils out of your diet. There's not much vegetable oils. Great. Uh, for most people, that solves the problem. If a person is still running a high blood sugar, higher blood sugar than they would, would want to, the first step, of course, is to kind of go back to our menu and make sure that we're really following it. So if a person says, oh, really? Did you mean avocado? Did you mean peanut butter? Those are delicious foods, but they are loaded with fat. Okay, so we remove those. And for most people, you'll see the blood sugar continuing to come down because insulin sensitivity has improved. The next thing you can do, though, is to uh, modify what is left. Uh, back in the 1980s, Dr. David Jenkins invented the glycemic index, which simply says things instead of white bread have rye or pumpernickel because this, it raises the blood sugar much less aggressively. And so favoring low glycemic index foods is a good idea. What are they? Fruit, it's sweet, but it's low GI for the most part. Beans, you can't do better. So focusing on those foods is often a good idea. And then finally, I should say that there are some folks, if they've had diabetes for a long period of time, what they'll discover is everybody gets kind of a different result. If the pancreatic beta cells have been beaten up by diabetes over the decades, their blood sugar may come down, but may still be higher than, than you would want it to be. In that case, you work with your caregiver and you just see uh, where, where you want to go with it. Um, but maybe the last thing I should also say is if you lace up your sneakers, uh, what are your muscles using for fuel? They use glucose. Your blood sugar is going to come down. Great. Thank you so much, Thank doctor. You. Good question. Okay. Thank you. So um, our next uh, question is coming from Trudy Lewis. Trudy, go ahead and ask your, or state your name, where you're from, and ask your question. Hi, good morning. My name is Trudy Lewis. I'm from Trinidad, West Indies. Um, my question is, as it pertains to um, like endometriosis and fibroid, I got that you're saying that we should like do a whole food plant-based or vegan diet, but do you recommend any type of fasting or should the meals be three, three times a day? That's the question. Thank you. Okay. Well, Trudy, thank you for that question. Um, the research that we did did not include fasting. It didn't include meal timing. Now there are some people who do this um, where they'll have one large meal per day or maybe two, a large breakfast, a pretty large lunch, and they may not eat then the rest of the day until the next morning. There's no reason not to do that. You could do that if you wish, but that's not what we did. What we found was that the hormones could be controlled by eating any time of day you want it, but just the quality of what people ate was no animal products, oils very low, and including the soybeans. Great, thank you very much. Our next question is coming from Michelle. Michelle. Suchensky. Michelle, go ahead and state your name. Make sure I said it correctly, uh, where you're from and, uh, and state your question. 
Sure. Hi, Dr. Barnard. I'm Michelle Suchensky from Alexandria, Virginia. And my question is about vegan versus raw vegan for Sorry, Michelle, we lost your audio. Um, if you can take care of that, we'll and then uh, we'll come back to you. We'll we'll try you again. Well, I'll tell you what. It, it okay. sounds like the Cook Food Council must have cut her off in mid question. So, <laughs> so Michelle, um, first of all, hi. Thank you for coming, calling in, and and you're you're asking about raw foods. Let me let me just respond to that uh, directly. Sure. First of all, I think raw foods are great. Um, I, you have to believe that our species did not evolve with sterno. So we were eating raw things for much of our sojourn on earth. But here's the, 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 the issue that we have is that we aren't really entirely sure what those foods were. Um, for, because human beings evolved in Africa, probably Eastern Africa. And a lot of the foods that people are eating nowadays the tomato sauce on your pizza, the peanuts and so forth, or potatoes, those are North American foods or Central American foods in some cases. And, and human beings didn't taste them until uh, people arrived in the Americas. So what were the foods that were indigenous to Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, these kinds of areas? And we don't really know. Um, so my thought is we eat... Fruits, obviously, fruits are terrific raw. Many vegetables are terrific raw. You can have spinach cooked. You can have spinach raw. You can have a cucumber cooked. You can have it raw, fine. Uh, with cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and so forth, they tend not to, um, the cruciferous vegetables tend not to be very digestible um, unless you really cook them. So I suggest cooking them until they're soft if you have any kind of problems with them. Grains, you can't eat a grain that's raw unless you sprout it, in which case you can eat lots of it. Same with beans. Okay, so um, Michelle, you were asking raw versus uh, vegan for hormonal balance. Raw would be fine. We did. We haven't done a study to see if raw is better. Um, in the 84 women that were in our study, they were the rules were vegan diet, cooked or raw. Keep oils really low. Half cup soybeans a day. If you want to do raw, you can do it. Uh, don't eat raw soybeans. Um, you want to make sure that, that you could sprout them or you could eat soybean products. But see, see what happens. Let me know how you do. All right. Great. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Ali D. Ali D, state your name, where you're from, and your question. Yeah. I've had a critical vitamin D for years from undetectable to seven to 13. I take 120,000. Uh, international units per week, as in 50,000 in a prescription and then 10,000 daily. And I feel like maybe my bones are deteriorating because my bones and my legs hurt when I go to bed at night. And I've noticed a gait change where I drag one leg and the other leg kind of swings out. And I'm worried that maybe I've done permanent damage to my bones and what I could do to get it higher. Okay. Well, first of all, Ali, I'm sorry. Thank you for calling. Thank you for watching the program. And I'm sorry you're dealing with this issue. This is an individual issue that sounds important and, and is something that I would strongly encourage you to see. I'm sure you're doing this already, but if you're not, talk to your endocrinologist about what you're doing. Follow your endocrinologist's advice. I don't think I or anybody participating in this would be giving you individual advice on, on something like that. Now, you might say, well, I talked to my endocrinologist and the endocrinologist didn't really have the answer for me. In a number of cases, you have to have a second opinion or a third opinion. And if you've got kind of a tricky issue where you're not getting the answers you need, what I encourage you to do is to look at a major medical center, look at the department of endocrinology and who's the head of it and call, uh, call there and you're gonna get the most experienced person or let them know your condition so you get a person who specializes in what you need. So don't hesitate to get a second or even third opinion so that you're getting the care that you need. Great advice, doctor. Um, all right, so it looks like we have Kathy Sabo again, and I'm gonna unmute her and let her go ahead and ask her question. Oh, I'm happy to be back, thank you. Um, so my, this question is about hormones. Um, I had a hysterectomy about seven years ago, and I think I I, I had this aha moment that um, 
once upon a time, I heard someone talking about something called sarcopenia and I didn't know what it was. So I Googled it and I, I read that sarcopenia is where you've got this big fat cap on your, on your, on your muscles on, instead of muscle in your body. So I, I had been <laughs> jiggling my thigh uh, a lot and thinking, gosh, I got a lot of fat. And I'm wondering if sarcopenia or this large fat cap, now I know that I'm not as physically active, but does it have anything to do with the hormones that I've lost as a result of having a hysterectomy? Well, first of all, it's a terrific question. A sarcopenia, which really, the, the, what it really refers to is a, is a loss of muscle mass, as you've been describing. It's actually really, really common. And it's, it's a common thing in men and women, perhaps somewhat more in women. Um, and it's, it hits us as we age. Um, and you do see it particularly with, with older folks. Um, and the naive initial response to it um, that people, doctors would sometimes prescribe is you need to load up on a whole lot of protein, eat much more protein, go out and get a big steak and that's gonna counter it. Well, feeding more protein in some cases may have sort of a marginal uh, effect on it. But the problem is that you're setting up a person for an even higher risk of cardiovascular disease by choosing that source. So you do need protein in your diet and the protein of course should come from beans and grains and vegetables. And you can get all the protein you need from plant sources better for you than protein from animal sources. Um, and should would HRT be part of it? We encourage people and frankly, all practitioners encourage women using HRT to get off of it. Um, because the concern is, that while you might benefit from it or feel some benefit over the short run with regard to vasomotor symptoms, as time goes on, the risk of breast cancer or other forms of, of serious illness accumulate the longer a woman is on it. So most all doctors who are prescribing it after a number of years, you start saying, we've got to get you off of this. And that's really good advice. Okay, I want to just say a big thank you once again to the organizers. Thank you so much for including me. I really, really, really appreciate it. I appreciate so much all that you do. And um, I look forward to continuing to, to uh, forward uh, this effort and see what we can do to change not just our own health, but the health of the communities in which we live. All right, great. Thank you so much, doctor, for your, your presentation and your time. Um, we're just gonna quickly unmute the audience so they can give their own little thanks to you. Um, so if we can take care of that. Um, everyone, you can. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barnard. I hope to see you Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.